Thank you, Susan Stewart. <clears throat> the next speaker is a professor of international law at Princeton University. Has written, uh, I'm told, more books than any of us can count on the fingers of both hands, and is also the gentleman who prepared the briefs that were submitted to the court uh, dealing with the illegality of all nuclear weapons. Mr. Richard Falk. Dear friends, I feel privileged to be part of this uh, beautiful and moving occasion. And since the uh, peculiarly powerful symbolism of the fact that this meeting here tonight uh, associates one with the Sisters of Mercy and their struggle for justice and liberation in the third world, which seems to me to be the other great struggle that confronts humanity at this time, the struggle against uh, oppression here and abroad, and the struggle against war and nuclear madness everywhere. And I have this sense that this week has a historic significance that goes beyond our feelings of solidarity in relation to the defendants in the trial. I have the feeling that we have come to a point in our darkness where there is beginning to be a feeling of capacity to see the light. And perhaps one has to wait until the darkness is very dark for that capacity to uh, be reborn within our culture and our civilization with sufficient strength to build the kind of movement that can begin to transform the structures of power that I do believe imprison us, however privileged we may seem to be. For some reason, I've taken Nancy Reagan more seriously as a political thinker recently. <laughs> And she said one thing that I think is unintentional, unintentionally pertinent to <laughs> our concerns this evening. She was trying to explain some years ago to voters in California that marijuana was a lot worse than liquor. And she said that when you're on a plane and the pilot is high on grass, you can't tell. But if he's drunk, you surely will know it. <laughs> now my sense is we've moved from a marijuana presidency. <laughs> of clinical alcoholism. <laughs> but that underneath this shift is really just a new blatancy that doesn't really change the character of the political system of which we are a part. I believe all of us would be here tonight if Jimmy Carter was president and Zbigniew Brzezinski was the national security advisor. The fundamental issues which are posed for American society at this time are not being addressed by our political parties and by those who are contending for power. And it's important, I feel, <laughs> Uh, to acknowledge the irrelevance at this stage of formal institutions, of official politics. <laughs> but at the same time that one says that, I think one has to have some concern about whether changes in degree carry this very dangerous way of behaving in the world 
past the threshold of tolerance. One has the assumption, somehow or other, that we can accommodate any level of the arms race, and somehow or other, it will uh, not explode in some catastrophic way. We really don't know that. And in some ways, it's very dangerous, this time we're living in, when there is no change in quality, but certainly a new blatancy, a new uh, determination that stretches across the center of the entire political spectrum to the far right uh, to accentuate the worst tendencies, the worst evils uh, that are part of this militarist imperial identity uh, that we have fastened upon ourselves and are fastening on others as well. A friend of mine, uh, Jim Douglas, is in uh, jail in, on the West Coast uh, for somewhat comparable reasons that have motivated the defendants in the Plowshare 8 case. And I'm sure he's known to many of you, but I wanted to read just a few lines from his, the statement he made to Judge Donald Boris on December 17, 1980, uh, just before he went to jail, because I think they do bear, at least on my understanding, of this case. He was refusing a $500 fine that had been imposed upon him, and he said, I cannot cooperate with that purpose. I believe every step of our nuclear madness, including the, process, the probation process for people resisting it, is immoral and illegal against God's law and human law. I want to resist every step of that process with all my heart. Arresting people for climbing the fence at the Trident base and jailing or putting them on probation is like trying to stop resistance to Auschwitz or Buchenwald, except that the atrocities in this case will be far greater, the nuclear crime more atrocious. I take those words very seriously and very literally. They are not hyperbole. They are not exaggerations. <coughs> and one of the things I think that I have learned from the defendants in this case is that the language of scripture and the language of justice means what it says. And that our own humanity and our own self-esteem means taking language in a very serious way. And I think that contrasts in an important sense with the way in which language is used in political discourse and indeed within uh, universities by and large, where it has become rhetorical in the worst sense, where the pieties are repeated and repeated, but have no connection uh, with the realities that they are supposed to point to. And indeed, all that is asked for in order to transform our civilization from darkness to light, is that we take the language of those verities that we affirm and that our tradition holds sacred seriously enough to act upon them. That is literally all that is asked. <coughs> and it seems to me that we can do no other than to respond in some way that acknowledges that level of seriousness. I want to say just a few words about the, <clears throat> the darkness of the law as it operates, because it seems particularly relevant to the events that will follow. For many Americans who have been schooled in the idea that courts and Congress provide a place of last resort for their grievances, the Vietnam experience was a very important learning process. 
because it became clear that the most significant claims that could be made by people affecting the very, their very own lives and the lives of others were questions that Congress never addressed in the course of that whole long war in any direct sense, and which the courts over and over again refused to provide any answer. They didn't provide the answer that uh, defendants who were resisting the war in one way or another were wrong for the following reasons, that the Constitution authorized uh, the President to act as he did. It was at a level of much deeper contempt for the citizenry in the sense that all the courts were prepared to say was that these are quote-unquote political questions that cannot be addressed in a court of law, emptying courts of law of their historic function, it seems to me, and in that way, undermining the legitimacy of the governing process itself. Because if citizens cannot go to their representative institutions and their judicial institutions, to redress their deepest grievances, then it does seem to me that in a very critical sense, we don't have democratic accountability. We are living in a political system that despite all its myths and all its illusions, doesn't allow us, doesn't give us the decency of an answer about the questions that are most critical for, our, for ourselves, for our children, for our civilization, for the world as a whole. And I think we have to think about the consequences of that kind of persisting illegitimacy and how one acts in the face of it. If one does take, literally, <coughs> the danger of nuclear annihilation, as posing an obscenity that is in every sense comparable in its magnitude uh, and in its quality uh, to what was done by Nazi Germany. I think that at the same time, it is very important, just as with the spiritual language that underlies our traditions and our convictions, to take seriously the language of the law. We presided after World War II in a series of trials that were held in Nuremberg and in Tokyo that judged German and Japanese leaders to be personally responsible for crimes against the peace and for various war crimes and crimes against humanity. We said on those occasions, as clearly as it's possible to say, uh, that these were not just laws being enunciated and applied by victors to the defeated, that one was setting forth principles that in a world of mutually destructive weapons had to be applied to all. The idea was, furthermore, that citizens, and the German people had been called upon during World War II by Franklin Roosevelt to act in resistance because, as we saw, the German war effort was a criminal enterprise and any opposition to it uh, was, in a sense, the effort to stop the commission of crime. So that in one very deep sense, it seems to me, nonviolent acts of civil disobedience that are directed particularly at the war machine itself, as this GE action was, emphasize the degree to which the legal tradition which we have, in some sense, formally affirmed, would provide all the exoneration 
that would be needed. That in other words, the Nuremberg conception of individual responsibility in a sense gives all of us a right and possibly a moral duty uh, to act in resistance against the commission of state crime. <coughs> and one of the things about the way the world is organized now is that there is an enormous mobilization of effort by official police institutions around the world to come back and oppose acts of resistance that are defined as crimes and terrorism. But that there is almost no effort and no attention being given to state crime, which is responsible for the overwhelming exploitation, suffering, and destruction of human values around the world. We, will, we have no just legal order until it extends itself to crimes of state as rigorously, and in a sense more rigorously, than it directs itself against acts of resistance. And especially in a democratic society which values citizen initiative, that kind of accountability, the opportunity to test official policies within judicial and representative institutions seems to me to be a vital ingredient of survival as well as of constitutional order. We know, and it hardly needs emphasizing, that we are moving, as one earlier uh, speaker uh, indicated, very close to the nuclear precipice. The encounter that is at the core, I think, of the particular danger of these years is a new resource imperialism that is struggling to control uh, the oil of the world and see to it that it continues to feed the extraordinary excess profits of the oil companies and that the rich peoples of the world continue to have at their disposal a disproportionate share of this dwindling world resource. So that in a, in a very fundamental sense, that struggle against <coughs> oppression in the third world is, in my view, increasingly connected with the struggle against nuclear weaponry and nuclear strategy here in the United States, because we increasingly are aware that there is no way to defend these imperial resource claims around the world except by our willingness to threaten nuclear weapons with increasing abandon. With all the talk of the rapid deployment force, which is a new way of talking about the Green Berets in the 1980s, there is very little conviction in the Pentagon and elsewhere, that that kind of military capability can uphold these interests. It's really a nuclear tripwire, and for the first time in the nuclear age, nuclear threats are being directly linked to our foreign policy in the third world. And for the first time in American history, I believe, we are claiming the right to intervene in other countries purely for the sake of our claim to the resources that lie in the ground of foreign countries, dishonoring whatever uh, reality remains to our own origins in a struggle for uh, self-determination and colonial independence. 
We are living, in other words, in the darkness of a very deep set of contradictions. I want to say one thing about the present situation that I think is very encouraging. I think there is, not only here but elsewhere in the world, a new sense of the obscenity of war. A sense that war as a social institution is just as obscene and as unnecessary for legitimate human purposes as slavery seemed to be, as slavery now seems to be. And as was also said earlier, there was a time when that opposition to slavery seemed foolish and unrealistic because everyone said that organized society required some kind of uh, slave labor to sustain itself. I believe in a very literal sense that war is at that stage where a world social movement can begin to take shape that challenges its necessity as the basis of security. It is no longer a viable foundation for security in the nuclear age. And the sooner people act as if that is the case, the better our chance is of moving back from the precipice and moving others, including the Soviet Union, back from the kind of disastrous policies that they are pursuing. I have been very uh, moved and affected by the various aspects of the Iranian Revolution in the last few years have been to Iran a couple of times during this period. And one of the things I think I learned from that revolution was the obscurity of power and the relation of forces within a society. Three or four years ago, 99% of the Iranian people thought that the Shah was impregnable and that there was no prospect of any kind of fundamental change before the end of the century. Within two years, 99% of the people were engaged in a struggle to eliminate tyranny uh, from Iran. There is, there was in it, obviously in that earlier period, a diffuse latent discontent that no one could see. Even the people living there, and certainly our CIA experts living there and here, there is, it seems to me, a very, I, I sense, and I think a lot of people sense, that there is an increasing level of latent discontent here in our country and that it is waiting to be catalyzed in some convincing fashion. And what seems to me at the present time to be weakening, weak and peripheral to the way power is distributed in American society could shift with extraordinary rapidity. <laughs> we should not in other words, read the New York Times to find the news that's fit to print. Because the realities of hope depend not upon what? Big time media and leading politicians tell us is feasible. But they depend much more, it seems to me, on the kinds of energies that are gathered in this room tonight and that can be spread very widely and very powerfully in the months and years ahead. And I believe that that is really the foundation of our hope because there is a spiritual energy that is waiting to be unleashed 
And it is that that I sense to be the light that is embodied in what the defendants have done for us and what we need to do ourselves. Thank you.